Um, here at Roger Williams, I teach a variety of classes, um, including a course on ocean hydrodynamics and a wind energy course. Um, and so if you were here for the president's opening statements yesterday afternoon, he mentioned fourth graders. Um, I'm actually the bold woman who runs that program. Um, so on Wednesday, we had 215 fourth graders um, in the rec center, which is just across um, the patio here. Um, my students from um, an engineering course partnered with education students here um, to teach the fourth graders over the past six weeks. Um, so we taught in 11 different classrooms across four different elementary schools. Um, my students ended up delivering 55 lessons about wind energy. Um, so we've got this pipeline happening um, with fourth graders. And in fact, it's really a project that started five years ago. So we have alum from that project that are eighth graders in the pipeline. So um, hopefully we'll see them soon um, in these seats or in your companies or getting tower certified um, and being technicians out in the field. Um, so I'm very excited um, to finish off a big week of wind energy here, um, starting with fourth graders, but finishing in a room full of really verified grown-ups. Um, so this is really a big thrill. Thank you. Um, today, we are um, looking at the session, Application Opportunities and Challenges of NPI in Offshore Wind Industry, U.S. and Beyond, company perspectives, and so we're very lucky to have five companies represented here today to share their perspectives. Um, so um, if you've been part of the symposium all along, you will recognize um, Atma Khalsa, who will start us off um, this, or this afternoon. Um, he is the Environmental Affairs Manager at Avangrid. Um, following his presentation, Rick Robbins, uh, Marine Affairs Manager at RWE, will speak. Then we'll pass the torch to Paul Pfeiffer, Permitting and Development Director um, at Attentive Energy, whose son may be in the room, a Roger student, <laughs> maybe hiding. Um, and then from Paul, we'll move on to Anthony Devarskas, Biodiversity Lead for Offshore North America at Orsted. And then we'll conclude with um, Jennifer DuPont, Jen DuPont, Strategic Permitting Manager at Equinor. Um, and we hope to have some time for questions. Um, the Dean of the Law School will join us at three o'clock to make some remarks and I can't hold up a Dean, so we're gonna finish at three. Um, so without any further ado, Atma, come on, come on down. very much again. Um, so I'm with Avangrid. <clears throat> I, um, you managed to get one presentation without corporate stuff, but I have to do it. Um, so who is Avangrid? Uh, Avangrid, we have a networks company that does power lines and whatnot, and we have a renewables arm. I work for the renewables arm. Uh, we started off as an onshore developer with the third largest onshore wind developer in the U.S. We are also part of the Ibrjola group. Ibrjola is, I think, the third largest utility in the world. Um, we have a pipeline of 38 gigawatts of offshore wind power. Um, most of these are in development, but we do have a few projects um, in the UK, in Germany, in, in operation, as well as projects in construction, Germany and the UK as well. And then in the Northeast, um, we have projects in the Northeast US, and then in the Southeast, we are, uh, own 50% of Vineyard Wind 1 which is in construction currently. We're gonna have foundations in the water starting in June. That's exciting. And then we'll take over O&M once that gets there. And then we have our Commonwealth Wind and Park City Wind projects, which are in late stages of permitting at the moment. Uh, so those are exciting as well. And a little far behind, we have Kitty Hawk, which is um, 3.5 megawatts. All right, so why are we really here? We are in the midst of a climate and biodiversity crisis. Um, WWF was in the room earlier, uh, a report that they put out since there's been a 69% decline in monitored wildlife populations since 1970, and it's only going to get worse with climate change. So all this discussion about net positive impact means nothing unless we mitigate the true problem. Um, so we need renewables and we need it urgently, and we're all kind of part of that solution. So we've got to keep our mind on the, the overall main goal here. <clears throat> so how are we going to do that? We need to do it. We need to do it responsibly. Avangrid has three pillars to our sustainability strategy. The first is circular economy, so reducing the impacts that our supply chain has with mining, uh, just materials, that sort of thing. 
Uh, we have a climate action plan, so our scope one, scope two emissions, what we produce, um, we are going to be net zero by 2030, and our supply chain by 2040. Um, that's extremely difficult for a company that sells natural gas, but we're going to do it. And we have a biodiversity plan, which is what we're going to talk about today. But all of those things go to biodiversity, right? Um, creating, the, stemming the problem of climate change, reducing impacts throughout the supply chain, and then managing the problem of all our operations. So there's two key goals in our plan for the sustainability objectives. The first is no net deforestation by 2025. We have a large tree planting program uh, that we we're currently implementing. And then the next one is uh, net positive impact on biodiversity for all of our projects by 2030. Um, you've seen the mitigation hierarchy. Don't have to show you that one. Um, so how do we do this in practice? It's, it's hard. It's a work in progress, and if anyone tells you they haven't figured out, they don't. Um, I think it, it really starts with baselines, understanding where we are, what is the current state of the environment so that you can actually make that claim um, using science. Um, we do have internal baselines, uh, uh, guidelines for how we do baseline assessment that we're working on uh, and, and continually updating as the science gets improved. Uh, and then a key part of this is an internal uh, biodiversity accounting framework. Um, so we quantify the impacts uh, to, we're at this point, focus on threatened and endangered species, um, as well as impacts to habitats. And I think the latter is what's complicated in the offshore environment, as we've heard about today. Um, and there's trade-offs and, and there's lots of judgments about what that means. But from an impact perspective, we're kind of following the, the onshore model of habitat changed. Um, and then each project, is how it gets implemented, is each project will have a biodiversity action plan, uh, again, by 2030. Um, so these plans are pretty standard following kind of an IFC-style model, identifying what are the, uh, the species and habitats of concern, um, setting measurable, achievable, time-bound objectives and targets. Um, this, uh, there's a lot of good, good movement on that um, in, in the kind of global sphere. Um, and then just driving how are we going to get there? What are the strategies we're going to use? What are the actions we're going to need to achieve those objectives and targets? And then robust monitoring and review. Um, how are we getting there? And if we're not getting there, changing up and, and adapting what we're doing to, to get there. Um, <laughs> Challenges, challenges is a tough one. Uh, there's a lot of challenges to this. I think um, money is, is always the hardest problem. Again, I, I can't say this enough. This is the cutthroat industry. We are competing uh, based on what prices are going to be 10 years from now, building an industry while flying it, all those you know, you know, pretty cliche phrases. But, uh, so it's very difficult. And, and trying to, to convince internal stakeholders that that this is something that we need to do. Is, it can be difficult. So I think that's, I think, first and foremost, one of the things that I find difficult. Um, I'm not sure which ones of these I want to talk about. Technical solutions is also a difficult challenge. So um, there's a lot of talk of um, uh, use of eco-scour protection and, and new things that all good things. And um, the challenge is if, if, if you have to finance a project, that goes through a technical due diligence with a product that's untested, uh, that it can be unfeasible. So gravity-based foundations is one example where there's a lot of pressure for this, but hasn't been done uh, since 2013 uh, using much smaller uh, turbines. And uh, there's a lot of logistical issues to that. And so it's just one example that sounds really good in practice, but to make that happen, to, to integrate those you know, nature-inclusive designs, there's um, really, a lot of engineers in the back that are really questioning every, everything that we have to do. Um, and so that's kind of one, one key challenge. Um, and I guess I really just prefer to, to focus on the positives and then think about what are their opportunities. And so federal leasing, we heard about that. I was going to be one of my silver bullets. I'm sad to hear that uh, con conservation credits is not something that may be feasible. Um, but call your, uh, call your representatives and your senators to change the, that political a 25% cap. Um, the state power purchase agreements is also another great way to pay for things. So we've heard, again, great presentations, non-monetary factors. Uh, I really love the Dutch model of, of jacking up the, 
those to 50% uh, bio biological factors. Uh, but at present, or about 75, 25, and I think out of that 25% of non-monetary non factors, about 20% is jobs, because that's what people care about. Uh, so th let's advance that biodiversity. Let's, there's, there's open solicitations right now in Massachusetts, or soon to be in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Comment on that. Tell them that we want higher, higher quotas for, for environmental considerations. Um, Nature-inclusive design, I think, is a fantastic opportunity. Um, it would be great to help have conversations with, with the regulators on uh, showing us how to do it, firstly, showing what's, what's um, possible, what, what are kind of deal breakers in the regulatory process, what's not, uh, and then incentivizing it. Uh, I think the biggest thing for me is, is uh, the, the decommissioning. Um, you know, if we could say that if we're putting in nature inclusive design, we're monitoring it, it's having a, a, you know, a credible benefit, we're having reefs, well, let's not take it out because that seems kind of crazy. But, but there's trade-offs, right? The fishing concerns are something that we have, we have really are focused on as well, and, and that is a trade-off. If you know the reason why we're supposed to take them out is to reduce that impact, get back to kind of the current state. So, very thorny issue there. But I think there's a lot of opportunity to help make it more feasible. Help us, you know, help us help help you get there. Um, Host community agreements, this is another thing. So wherever we landfall, we do ha you typically have a host community agreement. Um, and uh, this is an area where um, it's not all the same. There's not kind of a one-fit solution, but there are opportunities. These, these are coastal communities. Coastal resiliency is something that's a key challenge. And these towns don't have any kind of way to pay for that either. These are huge costs. Uh, so in our Vineyard Win One project, for example, we're co-locating our transmission cables with uh, sewer improvements, so expediting a plan the town had in the future, making it more cost effective for them, and, uh, and cleaning up the uh, kind of coastal water quality uh, issue, so a good example of a potential biodiversity benefit. Not linked to impact, but they are positive things and a way to pay for these, these, uh, these actions. Uh, and then data sharing. Again, one of the least sexy topics, but advancing conservation science comes in many forms, and uh, using data uh, in a way that helps decrease risk of projects to understand the, uh, you know, what are the issues and, and, and kind of how do we change things, I think is an important thing. Um, and we have these, these research stations, I've, I've said this before, we have towers that have high-speed internet, electricity, power, uh, weatherproof areas, they're 300 meters tall, so uh, you can outfit these things with you know, additional sensors and whatever that can help go beyond impacts, but monitor the health of the ecosystems in, in an area that's fairly uncharted, you know, relatively speaking. Uh, but that can't be all on the developer. We need kind of public-private partnerships and, and just think collaboratively about how are we advance in conservation. Um, I'm gonna go back real quick and, and just talk about a few international examples. Uh, and I think uh, the others will, will cover this, but some of my uh, international colleagues we have, um, uh, we've been doing some reef, artificial reefs in Japan in that top, um, top picture, and that's kind of what one of the areas you'll see focus for, for net biodiversity positive um, and, you know, nature inclusive design with scour protection, that sort of thing. Um, aquaculture is another interesting area, so the multi-use aspect uh, is something that is uh, something that's kind of on, on the floor. Um, and then the second picture is in a kind of estuarine uh, rehabilitation project in the UK. Again, we've talked a lot about off-site restorations. And then the third is a, a Kittaway Hotel, the second time that's been dropped today. That's in Lowestock in the UK. So again, things about compensatory in nature, but um, I think those are kind of three good examples of the types of uh, kind of net positive actions you'll see. So that's it for me. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Rick Robbins, Marine Affairs Manager with RWE, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to share perspectives on how we think we can make progress on uh, ecological and um, net positive impacts uh, for biodiversity. So uh, this has been a really rich discu discussion uh, thus far, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of it. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll be running through uh, our perspective on how I think we can make progress on this, and I'll touch on 
policy as, as one of the drivers uh, and, and, and get into some of the opportunities and, and some challenges I think we face. So the worldwide loss of biodiversity and damage to ecosystems is seen as a serious global risk for the planet. Accelerated by climate change, it's becoming increasingly important to address. You all may recognize this from the last report of the IPCC on uh, impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation. Um, we, we use this uh, to frame and introduce our biodiversity policy. So the, the policy is set up um, to create a framework to integrate biodiversity protection and, and advancing biodiversity enhancement across all of our business operations. And, uh, and, and it, it, it turns on this IPCC declaration. Um, the policy itself is ambitious. It includes a commitment to net positive impacts. Um, it's intended to be adaptive. It's intended to be collaborative and, and science-based. So just reflecting on that concern that IPCC made in that declaration, I think you know, it's important to ask what, what can we do as developers? What, what, what can we do to interdict these impacts on biodiversity? What, what can we do to interdict the impacts on climate change? And I think this is our moment. I think we have a lot of opportunity in this space to make significant advances. So RWE has made a number of commitments here, and, and th these reflect commitments in the wider industry. But RWE has committed 50 billion euros of investment by 2030 in green generation capacity, and along with that, a commitment to generate 50 gigawatts of green net capacity by 2030. These are huge commitments. Um, they parallel our own commitment to achieve carbon neutrality, those targets being uh, developed in consultation with the Science-Based Target Initiative. So RWE is one of the world's leading renewable energy companies. And I think with that scale come opportunities. Um, we have opportunities to innovate. We have opportunities to uh, develop knowledge through the implementation of pilot strategies. Um, but as we do this, we want to learn. So, so, so as, we, as, we implement, as we implement pilot strategies, we have an opportunity to transfer knowledge and to use those to inform the development of best practice. We can do that internally across the enterprise, and we can do that externally. And I, I, I said I'd touch on policy as a driver and how I think that can make a difference for us. And I'll just share a, a, an, an anecdote from the project level. Uh, but last June 1st, our offshore CEO gave a, gave a kickoff talk for our offshore business. And he said this, he said, for new assets, we aim to achieve a net positive impact on biodiversity by 2030. And, and I've, I've been around a number of marine conservation initiatives and marine management initiatives that I thought were pretty ambitious. But when I heard this, I was, I was truly impressed. And, and, and this, this was a claim uh, and a statement that, that really, I think, captured the imagination of our team. And, and we have brought this down into the project level and have been working on it ever since. But I, I think setting the stage with that statement uh, for us made, it, made a significant difference in, in, a, in a way that we're going to seek to operationalize. Um, so internal policy as a driver. Uh, starts with the policy commitment at the top of the company. Um, but in order to make that effective, we have to have the means to implement that at the project level uh, in order for it to be an effective driver in the context of trying to achieve net positive outcomes. Um, and so again, we found this to be extremely aspirational and inspirational. Um, it was highly resonant with our team. Um, and I think ambitious policy can animate teams and drive implementation when it's embraced at the necessary levels. But doing that and doing it effectively also means integrating that across project work streams. So somebody said, you know, it's easy to be ambitious, but how do you do it, right? I mean, how do you, how do you put it into practice? Um, and that's, that's largely why we're here. But I, I think in order to achieve net positive outcomes at the end of the process, uh, there has to be a commitment up front. I mean, we, we, we can't simply come in at the end and mitigate our way out of it or mitigate, mitigate our way to it. So there has to be a strategic commitment at, at the beginning. Um, we have to work to define biodiversity net positive impacts and what we're actually trying to accomplish. Um, and, and, and we see that as being an extension also as we define that of our, of our policies, of the commitments we've made, 
Um, we envision that being grounded in best practices and also uh, grounded in the, in the learnings that we've had across the company and across the enterprise. Um, and then contextualizing those net positive objectives w within the broader ecological objectives and environmental objectives that we have. Um, yesterday, there was quite a bit of discussion about uh, whether we should be thinking at the project level, at the system level, whether we should be thinking about just uh, net, net positive ob objectives with biodiversity and those metrics or broader metrics and other social objectives. And I would say yes to all those. So, so I, th I think we, we, on the one hand, we have to be able to implement it at the project level. We should be thinking at the large marine ecosystem level, I think, systematically. Um, we have to think about how to coordinate between and among projects and working together with some of the regional initiatives. Um, th there's a lot of opportunity for that. Um, but I also think in order to be successful, uh, ultimately we have to think about broader objectives that include social and broader environmental objectives. Um, we, we propose to take a collaborative approach. I think this is going to be really critical to the overall success of making progress on this and, and project success. So we propose to work with environmental NGOs that are already active in the space, uh, including the Nature Conservancy, uh, working together with regional universities, regional science centers, and other stakeholders. Um, and I think that'll be a critical aspect to this. But we have to define science-based targets and then develop monitoring programs and track the performance against targets. Um, knowledge sharing will be very important in this space. Uh, and, and that'll be true internally and externally. So if we think about internal programs and pilot strategies, we can put those in place to help advance knowledge sharing within the organization. But then we need to share those externally. We need to share the learning uh, through the regional initiatives. We need to share the learning um, through coordination with other, other developers as well. Um, but the, uh, the other thing, and it's come up repeatedly, but the issue of data is a, is, is a big deal. Um, and, and, and that's something where the, I think the regional initiatives will be important um, in, in determining how to best advance an, an, an integrated and cohesive approach to having access to data and integrating that in, in the sharing process. So we talked yesterday quite a bit about the mitigation hierarchy, and I'm not going to rehash it, but um, you know, I, I would like to point out that um, we, we can't just come to the top of the pyramid and put a flag in it. Um, the, the foundation of the pyramid with respect to avoidance is absolutely critical. So, uh, and just trying to think about that in the context of this broader discussion about achieving net positive outcomes, you know, I think it's important to consider how that aligns broadly with some of these other objectives that we're trying to achieve. So um, this will put a real focus, I think, and a premium on the on, on BOEM's siting process. Um, and that conti I've, I've watched that from the beginning. It continues to evolve. And now with the addition of the in-cost modeling and that, that work that's coming through, through to support uh, some finer scale analysis and consideration of different elements, I think that'll be important to help avoid impacts and put us in a position where we can align with some of these broader objectives. But I think the way that we do this is going to be very important. I think uh, engaging well with stakeholders and, and with partners and with experts that can help uh, develop those objectives and also develop effective mitigation strategies, I think will put us in a position ultimately to achieve and really deliver on uh, beneficial outcomes for the environment and for society. And thank you very much. Afternoon, everybody. I'm Paul Pfeiffer. I'm with Attentive Energy. Um, I will say my son is here. There's my point. Of... <laughs> he knew I was going to do that. Um, so I uh, make sure I've got the right one. Yep, the obligatory corporate slide. I won't go through this, and I don't. I apologize to my fellow developers. I have no idea why we're the isolated, sad little blue dot out in the ocean. We're not alone. There are uh, lease areas all around us. Um, fortunately, we're not that self-centered. Um, we have one of the new New York Bite areas. We uh, Attentive is a subsidiary of Total Energies, and I mention that because it'll it'll become important. We are paying attention as others here to the global discussions that are surrounding this. 
And I will say, I really just have one slide. And the slide I put together maybe a week ago is probably outdated from what I've learned over the last uh, 12 hours, 24 hours. I've learned so much already and energized uh, and also challenged to try to figure this out. Um, I will say, as we've heard, right, there's no set standard. Uh, we have a project, uh, uh, Total Energies has a project out in the UK called Outer Dowsing. And if you go to their website, the first thing they say is they're doing a net positive impact to biodiversity. It's a UK project. As we heard, um, I'm not really sure they know exactly what that means, right? So we're saying this, but we're still figuring it out. So there's a caution here that if we're inconsistent, we developers, frankly, will start making this up a little bit. And because we all need that competitive advantage, as Atma said, that this is a competitive industry, the fear that if there's an inconsistent language out there, we're gonna make it up on our own. We don't want that, right? You don't want that. Let's figure this out together. Let's have a consistent way so we can compare projects, we can measure projects, we can show success. Just like da data standards, we need a way to consistently talk about this. It's not there yet. Uh, and we, we, you know, let's go to our better angels and, and constrain what it is we all can do uh, by dictating how it's all done. Uh, and as folks have talked about, there's the complexity, right? Are we um, talking about a single indicator that's species-based? Are we talking about a, a multiple system framework? Um, I would ar articulate that where I think we've gone and what I've heard in the last few hours and yesterday is that starting out small, uh, maybe that's what digestible here in the U.S. Let's, let's focus on what we can do taxa by taxa. Is it a fisheries based? Is it benthic? Is it birds? Is it bats? What are those in, in indicators? What are the metrics we want to achieve? H help uh, us developers figure those out and then we can start implementing those. We're doing a lot of pre-construction monitoring, a lot of during construction monitoring, post-construction monitoring. It's not too hard to factor those in. If we want to know where, what the bird situation looks like now, we're getting a sense of that beforehand. Let's factor in what those true indicators are so that post-construction, uh, we're, we're all monitoring it in the same fashion, right? I think Fish and Wildlife Service is looking for us to do post-construction monitoring. Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, they talk about sort of five years post-construction, but it's a 25-year project, so once every five years we go out and collect data. Maybe we front load it the first three years, we do a bit more. We could all do that pretty consistently. We can look at uh, consistent metrics of how we're uh, benefiting or not benefiting uh, birds. There's this overall to us is, to me, is a, a big risk assessment, right? And, and here, the big point that I'm trying to make is Risk is spatial, it's temporal, uh, and we need to factor all those elements in. We've got short-term risks from pile driving, as the Thor's hammer was mentioned, right? Uh, how do you put those risks in comparison to the long-term benefit or the long-term risks associated with climate change? Uh, yes, our project is not gonna solve climate change, it's a piece of that puzzle. There's a net benefit from a greenhouse gas emissions produ perception, uh, production, how do you juxtapose that risk compared to the short-term impact of uh, marine mammal harassment? Uh, look, same with benthic habitat. We've got short-term benthic habitat uh, effects through pile driving, through scour protection, through cable laying. As Block Island shows, maybe you have some long-term benefit of benthic habitat and EFH, essential fish habitat, at least for some, t some species over the long term. How do you sort those out? Are we smart enough to put that together? And if you were to create an uh, NPI framework, can you look at those risks overall? Can you look at that risk of not building the project versus the benefit of building the project? And I will say here, this isn't on the slide, this is some of the stuff I've been thinking about, is this is one of the big challenges I think we face is and I, I spent 20 years as a federal regulator working for the federal government. So uh, I apologize, I don't mean to impugn any of my federal colleagues here, but we are still operating under 50 year old environmental regulations, right? That came about in the 70s, whose main purpose was to stop pollution and unfettered growth. Very successful, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, they've been successful, right? We're in a new era. Our job is now not to stop growth, it's to promote the growth we want, right? So 
J.B. Rule, who is a Vanderbilt uh, law professor, wrote an article, What Happens When the Green New Deal Meets the o uh, Old Green Laws? That's the situation we're in. We need to adapt to figure out how not to say what we don't want, but to incentivize the behavior we want, which is growth of products, projects like this that, yes, will have risk, will have impacts, but you really have to look at those impacts in relation to the, the cost of not acting here. And I would argue that these things are beneficial overall. And I would say that maybe that final point there is we do have a role. We do have some opportunities here. And maybe it's not through those narrow specific laws like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act. Those are beneficial to paint out the picture. What we do have here is we have NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. As Martin from Bohm had said earlier, maybe the government isn't going to lead and use NEPA to create alternatives that look at what a net positive impact looks like. Maybe they don't feel that's part of their mandate. Though I will argue, under the new uh, proposed amendments to NEPA, focusing on greenhouse gas emissions, right, they are this administration saying we need to take an expansive view of climate change in NEPA. That's a first step, right? That's going to help you understand the risks of, associated with these projects in, in the larger picture. And I'm, I'm fortunate I'm far enough away that my uh, developer colleagues can't kick me, but I think NEPA could also look at what a net positive impact might, might consider. You could put that as an alternative under NEPA to consider. Our concern, right, is that you're going to be asked to do it. Uh, and if it's not doable, if it's too expensive, if it's uh, not, the alternative has to be reasonable, but if it's, if it's too far of a reach, it really encumbers us as we, we build the project. So I guess I would argue from where we sit, it's probably not the federal government that's going to lead this. It's us developers and probably the states, right? We could come forward and say, and I think as others are saying, they're committing to long-term uh, not just have a no net loss, but a net uh, positive impact. I would challenge them, I would challenge us to sort of say, okay, here's what that exactly looks like. Um, and uh, put that in our our proposals to the federal government, the construction and operations plans we put together, put that into the bids that we put. I will note that the states also could play a big role, right? Our golden ticket is to go get a contract with a state. Uh, that gives us that 25 years of contract assurity that we need for these very expensive projects. What you saw in New York, New York recently said they want, uh, they would look to developers to aim to achieve a no net loss of biodiversity aim to achieve a no net loss of revenue to commercial fishing. You don't see that in the New Jersey bid that's out now. You, I haven't seen that in other states. So I think there's room to grow. And I think maybe, and I don't want to speak for the states, but if I were in their shoes, I'd, I'd say, well, I'd be hesitant to ask for something from a developer when I don't really know what that means. And I don't know how to, to reach it. So I'm not going to be unreasonable and ask them to do it. So the more I think we create that sort of precedent, that consistency of here's what it looks like, here's what it sounds like, here's how we can do it, I think the more and more you'll see the states doing it, and it'll be self-fulfilling. The states will ask for it. It'll be a condition, condition of the contract for us to get a, 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 you know, this 25-year agreement, and we are going to start doing it more and more. Uh, and NEPA also has that ability to look at risks across spatial scales, right? geographic uh, uh, sc scales as well. That's so essential. right? How do we take that big picture and say, again, the value of this project overall? So I think we're there in starting this discussion. I think the uh, baby steps are available. Um, and I would, my ask to you all is to help us as developers sort of think through how we best do this, right? And I think, because I think there is, as you're hearing from my colleagues, a willingness to figure this out. But piece by piece, what does it look like? What's a reasonable first step? I will say the other factor here, and maybe I'm a, uh, alluded to this, is cost, right? This is a really competitive business. And, it's competitive in the sense that, look, I want my project to succeed. I think we all individually want our projects to succeed. I don't want anybody else's project to fail. It's too important for me to say they shouldn't succeed as well. But how do we do that with 20%, 30% inflationary pressure? Um, you have the states, as we heard earlier, the state is saying we want to bid 70% of our uh, criteria is price. That's the biggest thing we're going to look at. And the, what the projects you gave us before, those are too expensive. We want it cheaper. Oh, and we want you to do all these things under 30% inflationary pressure. It's a lot, right? Just from a business case, it's a lot. These are $10 billion project, billion dollar projects, 50 miles offshore. 
it's gonna, if, it, if it's a 25 year project, you're not gonna start recouping those $10 billion, which is all front up cost, to year 17, 18. So, and I know you're probably sitting back saying, the totals of the world just had their most profitable year ever. Fair enough. But we want them to keep investing in this technology, so at some point it has to be uh, beneficial. It has to be financially beneficial. So how do, we, how do we put this all together in a reasonable way where we can say this is important because you hear the companies, my company included, saying this is super important, we want to commit to this, but how do we make this beneficial and financial and feasible in the long run? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, great to be here. As everyone else has said, this has been a, a fantastic opportunity to hear uh, a, you know, a lot of great presentations. And, and actually, you know, I, I worked at NOAA on damage assessment. I've worked a lot in environmental and ecosystem accounting. Uh, so it's, it's, it's fun to kind of see these worlds uh, coming together here. But right now, I'm the regional biodiversity lead for offshore North America with Orsted. Um, and just to give a bit of background, uh, Orsted, and let's see if I have the right one here. There we go. Uh, Randy mentioned this before, but just to reiterate, or if you didn't see Randy's presentation, our biodiversity ambition is that all of our renewable energy projects post-2030 uh, will have a net positive impact on biodiversity. Um, and one of the ways that Orsted has tried to make sure that we can get to that is by ramping up this biodiversity program of which I'm the regional biodiversity lead for offshore North America, which means there's an onshore biodiversity person and lead for onshore North America. There's someone working in the UK, continental Europe, and Asia and the Pacific. So we have different people who are kind of following what's going on with biodiversity in each of those markets. Um, now, as everyone said here, there's an exciting thing about having this ambition, right? Which means any project moving forward, given the timescales for development of offshore wind, right? Any project moving forward in North America that Orsted gets, right, is going to have a commitment to be net positive and is going to invest in being net positive. And the daunting thing then is to figure out by 2030, how do we get there, right? And how do we actually measure and do that? So it's, 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 uh, it's a great period to be doing this, this work. Uh, Rennie mentioned this before, so I won't spend too much time here. Um, but I think when we think about what, this is, it doesn't surprise anyone, one of the things when we're trying to develop these ambitions is how can we focus the efforts in what we think about related to biodiversity? And so what are the key biodiversity features that we're considering when we're looking at our offshore wind areas, right? And for us, right, again, not a surprise, it's birds, intertidal habitats, benthic habitats, marine mammals, and fish. Um, and again, those intertidal habitats are important because we're not just talking about the offshore lease area, right? Our biodiversity ambition covers everything from the offshore lease area through the transmission cable into the point where it interconnects onshore, right? So there will be different kinds of habitats that are involved in different stages of the process. And of course, what's going to come up is what's been discussed a lot here is how do we then trade off across different habitat types or do we trade off, right? If you have offshore impacts and intertidal impacts, can you do relatively more intertidal to make off for differently valued offshore habitat that's being impacted. Um, so the challenges that, we've, uh, that we foresee and are encountering as we're developing this, uh, again, Randy briefly went through some of this. I think understanding our footprint is a big one. There's a lot of data that's being collected that will help us do that. As was mentioned, during the site investigation process and during the monitoring process going to, that's going to be going on for the existing projects, which do not fall under the biodiversity ambition, there will be a lot of data that are collected. And it will help us to better understand how we collect those data best and what they mean and how to analyze them in terms of biodiversity. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the measurement of that is the tricky part, and that's, that's going to be interesting, right? Because we need to think, we're not going to be able to, we know, and I think you all probably are aware and it's come up a bit, we're not going to be able to measure every single thing that's going on in that space and the impacts on every single species that's, that's, that's happening. So how do we focus in on the things that are most important and most relevant? Um, the dynamic nature of the system, of course, is a big challenge as that's been mentioned in, in many different places. Um, I will say I think there are some lessons to learn from terrestrial environments. A lot of times we think the ocean's more complex, but there's, there's pretty complex things that also go on in, in terrestrial environments as well. Um, the in initial investment cost has come up several times. I think there is this uh, 
uh, opportunity that we have to uh, include what we think are benefits to society within the cost structure of the development, right? Which is something that we know in the past has not necessarily been included, right? If we think about it from an eco economic standpoint, right? Internalizing some of the externalities that, that have not in the past been included, right? And so how can we do it actually in a way that's net positive, right? Rather than just no net loss. And, and how do we do it to make the industry also able to function, deliver on the actual goal, which is the delivery of the energy at the end of the day, right? Um, I think managing the stakeholder expectations is something we've heard a lot about today and yesterday. Uh, and uh, for, for Orsted, right, the fact that we're operating in markets where there's, you know, we heard about the UK and marine net gain, a place where there's active progress on marine net gain and how to move that forward, and the Netherlands where you have integration of biodiversity into bids explicitly, and then you have a North American market that, as we're here, right, is trying to figure out exactly where it's going, right, makes it challenging to figure out how do you develop that measurement approach that kind of addresses what's going on in all of these areas. And I think at Orsted, what we're, we're, we're thinking is that what's most likely going to be necessary is that we have a flexible framework that is an overarching framework that then is tailored to meet the demands and the needs of the, and expectations of stakeholders in each of those markets. Um, and of course, related to that is the changing policy landscape that as these projects develop and as we put bids in, and over the next 10 years, I, I hope, uh, there's a lot of progress in how we think about net positive impact, right? And there may be things ha happen by the time these projects come online and by the time we're trying to execute our ambition that are not the same as things that happen now, right? Because we have to remember that there's that long lag between getting the award for a project and the actual, you know, kickoff of the project energy, so to speak, and then the project duration, right, which is, is decades, decades long, so... Uh, and of course, the potential conflict with other sea users. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that if, as we're achieving the biodiversity ambition, we're not causing any additional conflicts uh, than, than may already be perceived already. Right. Uh, so, right now at Orsted, uh, our methodology and metrics for the biodiversity ambition are under development. We've done work. Uh, you heard yesterday from Claire from the biodiversity consultancy. Uh, we've done work with them related to how to develop this measurement framework. Um, we've also, uh, I think it was mentioned briefly in a couple of places, the science-based target network, uh, targets network, um, is working on developing a more standard approach to a corporate biodiversity methodology. We provided some feedback on that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that evolves over time. Um, and then I think what's really exciting is we have this toolbox of pilot activities that are underway. Um, and the, the goal of these pilot activities is to be able to understand uh, how, <laughs> What kinds of technology, what kinds of interventions, uh, what is appropriate in order to try and achieve that biodiversity ambition, right? And what do we see when we put things actually on the ground and start measuring them, right? Um, and, and frankly, to get at some of the cost issues that I mentioned, how much does this kind of stuff cost when we're trying to do it, right? Um, for the amount of uplift that you get out of it, right? Because we want to try and make sure that we're, we're being efficient in, in what we're doing, right? Um, in order to keep kind of a... <laughs> Uh, uh, oops, a pathway moving forward that is sustainable. So I wanted to just talk through a bit about our, you know, some of the items in our toolkit are, that's evolved, ever evolving. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any U.S. examples right now, but this is to give you a flavor of what might be coming down the line soon in the U.S. Um, uh, we have the cod pipes in our Barcella wind farm, uh, and during the construction of that wind farm, uh, which is in, in uh, Dutch waters, uh, we had four cod pipes that were built, and these are basically to provide habitat, obviously, for cod, which is a species of great concern over there, and also a species of concern over here. Um, and uh, one of the things that's a bit different, right, is the differences in the soft bottom versus hard bottom habitat composition there versus here, right? So whether or not these kinds of things would be appropriate here is an open question, right? But there's go the, the thing that we're really excited about is that as part of this project and all of these projects, we have monitoring that's going on uh, to see how they're performing. And we're not just using kind of standard monitoring approaches, we're also investigating newer tech, which doesn't seem quite as new anymore, but like environmental DNA and eDNA approaches, right? And how you can use those instead of more extractive methods to try and understand what's going around on related to biodiversity and how you possibly can couple the eDNA methodology with more standard methodologies to get to possibly eventually substitute out one for the other. Um, we have, and Renny mentioned these, uh, the biohuts in Grena, basically some cages that were put off, off the docks in Grenada, 
and uh, had oysters within them, sanitized oyster shell within them, and they're meant to provide habitat for juvenile fish uh, and, again, try to help out those cod populations. Uh, we have uh, more recently deployed in June 2022 uh, some 3D printed reefs at the Ann Holt Wind Farm. Again, these are not part of our biodiversity ambition. These are part of exploring how we do this kind of work. Uh, and so those reefs were deployed in June. There's going to be monitoring both by environmental DNA and using remote vehicles um, with DTU Aqua over there. Um, and uh, that map there shows where we've deployed the artificial reefs. And one of the other interesting things that we had done at Anholt, which is not pictured, is uh, when they were moving the boulders as part of the you know, clearance of the area, instead of just moving the boulders or you know, away and, and putting them somewhere else, they kind of arranged those boulders into a set of of, base, of artificial reef-like structures to see how they might actually uh, attract fish. So that's also going on in that, in that area. Um, a super, I think, exciting uh, <laughs> initiative that, that we have underway is something that's called ReCoral. Uh, and this is, again, we have work out in, in Asia and the Pacific, out in Taiwan. And what they're doing, we're doing is using the wind turbines as a base for supporting the growth of coral. Um, and the idea is that if this is a successful way of growing these coral out, that we'd be able to transplant them and use them in reefs. And it basically collects the indigenous coral from the area, grows those out in a lab onshore, and then transfers them back out offshore to work. Uh, and what's exciting about Orsted, what I find exciting about Orsted is that we kind of take on things like this, which <laughs> if anyone's worked on coral restoration knows there's a, a, uh, a, a, a decent possibility of it not working, um, but willing to take the chance and see if it actually is, a, is an opportunity to make use of those structures that are in the water. Um, and lastly, I think what, what may be a bit, clo a bit closer to home uh, is our Humber Estuary Restoration Pilot, which was off the east coast of the UK. Um, and Rennie mentioned this briefly before, but there's a it's in a tidal estuary in northern England. It was launched just last August. And the partnership is with local trusts, and that's how we envision kind of that a lot of our work is going to be taking place, right? Working with local communities to figure out what are the best opportunities for restoration, best priorities for restoration. Uh, so the, in this case, it's the Lincolnshire and Yorkshire Wildlife Trusts. And the targets for that work are uh, three hectares of salt marsh, so about, I think, seven acres, four hectares of seagrass, which is, I think, about 10 acres, and uh, half a million native oysters uh, put out into the environment. Uh, so it'll be really exciting to see, and there's monitoring that's associated with all of this work, so it'll be very exciting to see how this evolves. Um, and I think that's about my time, so uh, thanks very much. I'm doing the same thing. Which one is this? One of them works. One of them works? That one. All right, perfect. All right, hi everyone. No, I can't get back. Um, so my name is Jennifer DuPont. I'm the strategic, uh, well, now I'm head of technical environmental affairs, as you can see here. I just had a recent change in job, but I'm gonna be getting a little bit tactical, I think, um, on operationalizing net positive impact on an offshore wind project um, and give you a little bit of insight into what we just completed in a pilot uh, that we did with Equinor and BP. Um, so who is Equinor? Equinor Here's the obligatory slide that we all talk about. We are a global leader in the energy transition. We're a, a company of 20,000 people based in Norway, um, but we have offices obviously here in the US. We've got active projects, as you can see in the East Coast, our Empire Wind and Beacon Wind projects. And we're very happy to be provisional winners of a lease out on the West Coast on Morro Bay. Um, just a couple of things to note, we're also one of the leaders in floating offshore wind. So we have High Wind Tumpen and High Wind Scotland projects that are actual um, projects that are floating wind. All the other ones that you see are our fixed bottom uh, structures. So we've got quite a bit of steel out in the water already um, in the UK, the North Sea, um, and then working actively on our, our East Coast projects. And the, as I said, the East Coast ones are, are in partnership with BP. So we have a corporate biodiversity position, and you can kind of see the one that's most, uh, that's highlighted in red is really the one that's, uh, that's focused on a net positive approach. And this includes the development of action plans um, that, that are basically getting the project to net positive impact. And I think one of the reasons that I'm in such an 
tactical and operational space on this is that our commitment is for any project that goes to final investment decision after 2023, which we're in now, um, needs to have a, net, a, a NPI action plan developed. So we're right in the midst of this for our Empire Wind project which I've put a map up here on the right. Um, it is our project off of Long Island. It's about anywhere from 15 to 20 miles uh, south of Long Island. We have Empire Wind 1 and Empire Wind 2, so it's being developed in two phases. Um, and offtake has been secured uh, with, with, with NYSERDA for both of these projects. So they're, they're um, yeah, they're very close to, to construction, and we started a, a pilot to actually operationalize our commitment and our ambition, be, both from, from Equinor's point of view as well as BP. BP has a very similar um, net positive approach. So BP had been consulting with Flora and Fauna Institute, FFI, as well as a couple of other entities on bringing together a workbook approach to looking at NPI, and we leveraged that for Empire Wind, and it's the first time that I've seen it on an offshore wind project. Um, ooh, so this might be my old slides that are in here. Uh, everybody knows that one. Empire, so the Empire Wind NPI pilot methodology, I just kind of wanted to talk through it um, so that everybody kind of gets a sense for it. I think one of the biggest things to recognize is, you know, how we go about developing these projects and then what the regulatory process is, because we're trying to really fit in these approaches into both how we develop projects, but then leverage the environmental impact assessment process, which I think we've heard a bit from others as well. Um, so early planning stages, we really are focused here on avoidance. So this is in our concept selection um, at time. So focused on avoidance, really developing baselines and thinking through, you know, what our actual landscape is that we're, there, that we're working through. And then as we move forward, we look at NPI applicability and we have some criteria that we actually look at in terms of, are we operating this project? Do we have control of it? Are we, you know, are, are we working in an environment like in the UK where there are regulatory overlays to this or is there, are there other drivers driving us towards this? Um, biodiversity sensitivity, are we going through key biodiversity areas that, that trigger this or rare, threatened and endangered species? Those have been really our, our areas that we've focused on. Um, then we do a, a third task of scoping the, the NPI. So we look at project details. We start identifying those key biodiversity features. So again, habitats as well as a very species approach is what we've been taking. Just because right now that seems to be the, the mindset that we're in, I really appreciate all the conversations around fuller ecosystem functioning and want to bring some of that back to the table as we move forward here. Um, then we go into, again, the baseline piece. So we're really designing and scoping our baselines and updating our list of KBFs as we move forward. And then comes the impact assessment and mitigation measures. So really assessing that residual impact. And this is where I think it's just been so important to, to really think about those pieces in the mitigation hierarchy. I feel like we, we've been talking about it a lot, but it really is trying to make sure that we quantify what the avoidance, minimization, uh, restoration components have been before we get to the offsets as well as additional conservation actions that we talk through. Um, and then this is the part where we've, we've gotten to at this point in our pilot where it's now trying to establish targets and, and propose measures in terms of whether those are additional ecological offsets and conservation actions. And this is where I think that we've recognized that it's really important that we have external stakeholders, um, academics, ENGOs, communities involved in understanding a bit more of what we've been working on because we've been working this a bit in, in I would say, in isolation and it's now time to ensure that we, that we, um, that we validate this externally and have that buy-in. It's such a critical component to the NPI is that external stakeholder involvement um, in some of this. And that, that can make some of our companies a little bit um, 
a little bit, you know, worried about that because it is bringing in people to comment on plans that, as we've heard, have cost implications and have potential permitting schedule implications. And, and in projects that are as cost constrained as ours are at this point in time, that risk is something that internally we, we are trying to jump through those hurdles for sure. Um, and then we go through to the adaptive management po point uh, where we're doing the monitoring and evaluation. And then there's a transfer to operations, right? Once we've constructed these uh, wind farms, there's an entire operations and maintenance team that's going to be running this for the next 25 to 30 years, getting them up to speed on what NPI looks like, the continued adaptive management approach, and what our objectives are is another thing that we're, we're working through. Um, so just some of the lessons learned and challenges, and unfortunately, the, I think the slides that I had in here, I actually had a slide where for Empire, um, I had what, what, our, what, what it actually looked like in terms of the key biodiversity features. So just to kind of voice it over before I get into this, before everyone starts reading this one. Um, we had uh, six species, so piping plover, North Atlantic right whales, fin whales, loggerhead turtles, um, and then uh, Atlantic sturgeon were our key biodiversity features. In that table, we then, and then we had a, a bucket at the bottom for kind of ecosystem, appro ecosystem or habitat. We did a qualitative rating, just a red, yellow, green stoplight approach to what is the, what is the residual impact prior to mitigation for each of those. And, and I can show this slide to anyone who wants it afterward. I apologize, I don't know why it didn't get updated. Um, so th then we had the residual impact, then we had avoidance, a minimization, and restoration project impact. Um, measures that we took. So for piping plover, it's things like micrositing of cable corridors. It's it's you know um, looking at restoration, construction windows, time of year restrictions. For all the marine mammals, we're including things like protected species observers, vessel restriction, vessel speed restrictions, uh, again, time of year restrictions. All of these pieces that whether they're from our regulatory process or from our own internal standards that go towards getting your residual impact as low as possible, right? That's what we're trying to drive at all times is residual impact as close to zero or no net loss as possible. Because at that point, as I communicate to my project teams, we're avoiding the, the additional ecological offset and additional conservation actions uh, to the greatest extent possible. And then we can focus on those actions to get us above the line to net positive impact. So that's where we've started looking at things like how do we take credit for the deployment of PAM buoy, buoys, passive acoustic monitoring buoys in our Empire Wind area that we've had out there since 2019? We just signed a, an agreement with WCS for $9.5 million to extend the life of those buoys through 2028. That's something above and beyond regulatory compliance, and it is an additional conservation action that's measuring the acoustic signature and actually feeding into seasonal management areas and vessel speed restrictions based on whale presence. So one of my things is how do we get, how do we as developers get credit for the actions that we take early on whether they're research or deployment of technology, and credit those towards our ecological offsets or additional conservation actions to get that bit of residual impact that we still have left over for each of the features to zero and then get ourselves to NPI. So we've been really tactically looking at each of these features and how we can get each of those to an NPI. And what my table shows is at the end whether, whether we think NPI is being progressed. And I'll tell you right now, very similar to what a lot of people say, you know, for the bird species, I, I feel pretty good. We got a green going there. For anything that's marine, it's yellow because it's still unclear to me if we can actually get to a, a, a kind of understood or accepted place of net positive impact for right whales, for fin whales, for, for loggerhead turtles, for the sturgeon, right? And then the ecosystem approach is another one that we're thinking through. What can we do on scour protection? What can we do in terms of, you know, potential aquaculture on some of our foundations? And, and what does that look like in terms of net positive impact contributions? 
Um, so I, I'm happy to show anyone that table afterward or, or send it around because I think it's just a starting point. And for us, we now want to validate that externally. Everything from is our list of key biodiversity features correct or, or and also, you know, as we're thinking through this kind of qualitative stoplight approach to going from residual impact prior to mitigation, mitigation measures, residual impact, and then progress to NPI if we're kind of on the right track and what those projects that, like what Orsted was showing, how those actually contribute to that last column. So just quickly, some of the lessons learned and challenges. I think that for us, there's no regulatory drivers right now that's the corporate ambition um, we're, that we're working towards. And I, for one, feel very strongly that when we set a corporate ambition like this, and uh, all of the other developers and folks up here, I'm sure, agree, we need to figure out how to operationalize that, right? It, this can't just be words. This needs to, we need to figure out what this looks like, what success looks like, and we can't do it in a vacuum. We need stakeholder involvement um, and, and potential regional alignment, and that's where entities like RWSC and ROSA, I think, come in for us on the East Coast. Um, you know, we really want to make, ensure that we're looking at avoidance and, and uh, reduction and restoration, of course, that those are the, the fundamentals. The mitigation hierarchy is the fundamental principle underlying all of this. Um, and then we've just some, you know, questions have come up as we've been going along on quantification. In the U.S., it's actually quite easy, easy to quantify the residual impact on marine mammals, because that's what we do through our MMPA and our um, and our incidental take authorization. So you get to some some very good quantified numbers on what your residual impact is on marine mammals. We haven't really gotten there for our birds yet, but there are lots of different methodologies to do that in terms of collision risk modeling and other pieces that we can get to right. But one thing that we've been trying to, struggling a bit with is like how how quantitative do you actually want to get? and versus a qualitative approach, which is that stoplight approach that I was talking about that we've kind of fallen back on just because, and I think it was mentioned earlier, how, how do I, how do I, if I have an impact on one right whale, how am I going to show a 10, 20% net gain to that right whale, right? Like these are the questions that we've been battling with and don't have any clear answers on. And I think we need a bit of a, you know, guidance from experts and a bit of more discussion around these pieces. So all these questions around like for like versus, you know, broader type of mitigations, I think, oh, did it just switch? I don't even know. Um, it did switch. Oh, hold on, look at, I bet you I got the table now. Maybe? Uh, did it switch? Okay, maybe not. Oh, okay, here we go, here we go. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Someone did something magical. <laughs> All right, I was gonna show you this so that you don't have to just picture it in your head. Here. So this, this was our approach for empire, and I, I won't go into it in more detail, but other than to say there's our species, there's our residual impact prior, there are some of our measures that we take in order to get ourselves to a residual impact that again is, for me, this is regulatorily accepted, right? Like we can't be developing the, these projects if we have massive residual impact. So we're doing a bunch of stuff to get us to there. The contract language, that's another thing I haven't mentioned yet. The amount of this that's actually put on our contractors cannot be underestimated either. And the earlier on we get this into our ITTs, our invitations to tender, and get this out to entities like Harima and others that are actually doing our transport and installation of all these structures is incredibly important. So the earlier on we're doing this and understanding what our actual features are and how we approach this, we need to communicate this to our contractors. So you, it's not just the developers. We've got tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers that are also working on all this, right? Then I've got a list of potential NPI measures. So these are really the ecological offsets and the additional transformative actions, potential stakeholders and partnerships. So we're actively looking for this, again, to kind of help validate our approach or tell us that we're doing something completely off the wall. Um, and then continually reassess our progress towards NPI as we go 25, 30 years into operation on, on, these, um, on these wind farms. So um, again, here's just the quick 
submarine. There's no obvious US regulatory drivers at this point. We're setting local plans that link our biodiversity um, to, to other strategic objectives. We need to be pragmatic in how we balance this um, in our project design basis and, and, and our criteria on, around that. Um, and then I, I wanted to say, you know, how do we, like I said, how do we get credit for some of the work that we're doing above and beyond compliance and credit that towards our MPI and therefore inspire action on the part of developers, right? Like I'm looking to this community to help kind of validate some of the work that we're doing and bring forward those messages because that helps me internally continue to show the worth of trying to pursue this corporate ambition, right? Like the being able to talk about it, to get to get the 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 information out there is something that is incredibly useful for us. Um, quantification is an issue, and then, then we've got the stakeholder piece as well as um, strategic partnerships. And with that, I'm done, and thank you to whoever updated the slides. <laughs>
Yeah, and I'll just add that, like, you know, this our NPI ambitions, I'm pretty sure for all the other developers, they're just not, they're not just for offshore wind, right? It's for our entire portfolio of projects, which for like a company like Equinor is quite a bit of oil and gas projects as well. And also assets that have been operating for a while. So we're also, there's a whole component on looking at what your biodiversity features are on operating projects and then deciding how to contribute from a net positive impact there. So there's a lot in that space. And I do think sustainability reporting right now doesn't have great metrics around this, right? We talked about how to go from local and regional and, and scale it up to actual corporate metrics, and that's something that I think we're all thinking about and looking at GRI and other frameworks on what the direction is on that. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but yeah, I, at the end of the day, the way to communicate it is all through metrics, but metrics are really hard <laughs> in this stuff, you know? So that's why from a project, it's easier almost on a project level to decide what matters and approach it that way right now. Hi, I, it's really inspiring to see you all sitting here and to, to hear all of the different viewpoints of how you're all trying to actually achieve something really quite similar, but in different ways. And I couldn't help thinking, is that a cost efficient way to get to not net positive impact? <laughs> the fact that each of you, plus a whole bunch more, are all independently working with very large teams to try and work out how to do this. Is, is there a more cost efficient way to do it? <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> is, it, is it called the Netherlands? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I will say, I will say, I think, right, like, one of the things that, I, I mean, we're all here because this is a new and emerging area, right? And I think that over time, hopefully what we will do is be getting toward those more efficient ways of doing things, right? And that's, I, I think, where we are here and where there are global networks that are looking at this, like science-based targets for nature, right? Like or Targets Network, right, that, that there will be opportunities there to kind of bring together these different kinds of approaches, hopefully. Okay, we're going to take one more question. Yeah, I was just going to follow up on that um, comment uh, or question, I guess. I think economies of scale is, uh, is an important thing to think about with regard to, to this conservation uh, question and also thinking about from the biological perspective, from the ecological perspective, these are not uh, issues that are occurring at the site scale. They're uh, issues that are occurring at a much broader scale. So thinking about ways to think more broadly collectively, I think would benefit the resource as well as saving money. Yeah, I, that's a great point. And I, I would just say that what I think is also then corollary to that, right, is the there's the developer side of kind of working together to try and get those larger scale projects. And then there's also the state side, right, of, of uh, and community side of thinking more regionally about these kinds of challenges and being able to accept certain kinds of things that benefit things regionally while they may not have as clear a local nexus as, as one might think, right? So I think it's, that's why this conversation is great to have, right? Because those, those kind of things need to advance together, I think. You know, I think just quickly, the, uh, you know, the states and BOOM have, and Fisheries Service have all expressed a significant interest in trying to facilitate more coordinated approaches to scientific monitoring related to offshore wind development. And I think, I think that kind of uh, has the potential to, to fit in and help, help advance this as well. But um, that achieving that coordination through regional initiatives is also uh, going to be an important aspect of this. Great. Let's thank all of our lovely panelists for their input today. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. This is really, it's really wonderful after two and a half years of pandemic to see such a crowded room and people paying such attention and bringing such expertise to this conversation on such a very important topic. And we're really pleased and honored to host uh, this symposium. I want to thank uh, our students and staff, including Julia Wyman, who've done such a wonderful job uh, in making this happen. Uh, I also want to thank our co-host for the symposium, The Nature Conservancy, and particularly Tricia Yadley for planning and supporting this symposium. Uh, this is a, a cast of many people making this possible. And in addition, I want to thank Rhode Island Sea Grant uh, for, their, for their support as well. So wind, energy, and biodiversity and net positive impact are uh, important topics that matter greatly to the world of today and tomorrow. As I sat here and listened to this, uh, I just thought about my future uh, administrative law classes 
and how I might incorporate some of these into my teaching because it's such a complex, complex, multifaceted topic. But to have an efficient regulatory structure with the science behind it and the law and the regulatory structure for it and the engagement of, of, of both government and the nonprofit sector and the private sector, the for-profit sector, is just very important to make this sort of thing a success and it is, a, it is going to be a, a key feature, I think, of a successful future that we are trying to build toward. And at Roger Williams University School of Law, uh, we're proud to collaboratively lead the way in this work uh, through our Marine Affairs Institute. And the key word there is collaborative because it cannot be and should not be done alone. Uh, we work with other organizations. We have meaningful partnerships with the University of Rhode Island and with Rhode Island Sea Grant. And these relationships uh, and other relationships and the excellent work of Julia and her team and other colleagues at the law school uh, make our law school a national leader uh, in marine and coastal law programming and teaching and research, and we're very proud of that, and we're proud of the fact that we attract students from around the country to come to our law school and participate in our cutting-edge leading programs. And now, Rhode Island, the little tiny state of Rhode Island, is poised to lead the country with offshore renewable energy development. And our university and our law school and our partners are actively engaged in these efforts. And in fact, our law school has been engaged in some very exciting and impactful strategic planning over the last year and more. And one of our areas of focus, there are multiple areas, but one of those is the blue economy. And we have been exploring clinical externships, opportunities for those externships in the renewable energy sector. So if anyone is interested in engaging with our students in a clinical externship program, you know where I work. <laughs> Please reach out to me by email or phone. Please reach out to my colleague, Julia Wyman. Uh, and we have other opportunities as well that will be coming online for student engagement, including our new Green Energy Transactional Clinic, which I'm very excited about, which will help to train and educate students in legal, transactional, and regulatory work in support of renewable energy projects in New England. I'm really excited about all of this. Um, I think it is going to be a key part of our future in this part of the country and indeed across the globe. And I look forward to our continued fruitful partnerships uh, in this important work. And I'll close where I started, which is to say thank you very much for being here. It's great to see you all, and it is our honor and privilege to host you. So thanks for being here.